I would prefer negative pi over 3, which is the same as negative 60 degrees. All right? Okay, that's just uh, me kind of reminding you about how we defined inverse trig functions, the, the issues that we deal with, with domain restrictions. But we have to do the same thing for cosine. We have to restrict its domain if we want to talk about its inverse. But our domain restriction on cosine is different than on sine. Instead of between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, it's between 0 and pi. So on our unit circle, we actually cut off the bottom two quadrants for, co for the arc cosine. And then we go and we move on to the tangent function and then trying to find its inverse. And anybody remember what the restriction is for tangent to get it to be able to define the inverse? Same as sine. Same as sine. It's negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And then for the other three trig functions and their inverses, the domain restrictions are in the book and you can look them up. Not that important, all right? We don't deal a lot, honestly. We do not deal a lot with the inverse, the three inverse trig functions for uh, cosecant, secant, and cotangent. But you should know that they, they're there, all right? Okay, we have another property that we have to uh, deal with here. And this was this very important cancellation property. And it's just like I said with the car washes. You have the clean car wash and then the inverse will make it dirty again. Or you could start off with a dirty car wash and then go back clean. You, it doesn't matter which way you go through the functions. If they're inverses, then no matter which way you go through them, they undo each other both ways. And that's what this cancellation property says. It says if you plug x into inverse sine and then take that answer and plug it into sine, these two are going to cancel each other out and you're just going to get the x that went in there to begin with. And the same way if we do it the other direction. x goes into sine first, then you take that and send it through the inverse sine function, it's just going to spit x out. And that means that they essentially canceled. All right, That's what, what happened. But there's, there's some stuff we have to be careful with here. Extremely careful. So I'm going to give you couple of problems here to see what you get with this. So how about this? If I give you sine of arc sine of, let's go one. All right, you know, we'll do one that we just did. How about uh, negative root three over two? Isn't that the one we just did? What, was, what did we get when we took um, arc sine of negative root three over two? We got negative 60 degrees, right? So this should be sine of negative 60, which I'm going to put negative pi over 3, right? And what is sine of pi over 3? Well, or sorry, negative pi over 3. Go down, negative pi over 3 is right here. Because it's sine, give me the uh, y coordinate. Negative root 3 over 2. Hey, so everything worked out exactly the way we thought it would. You plugged in negative root 3 over 2. It went here, then here, they cancel each other out, and that just came out, right? And that's this first property. Uh, yes, the first property. See, because the x that we chose was between negative 1 and 1, it's going to work. So there's no issue there, right? Everything was nice and clean. Everything happened the way we thought it would happen. Let's take a look at this one and see, see where we might run into a problem. What if I say... What is arc sine of sine of 7 pi over 6? So you would think, oh, 7 pi over 6 maybe, right? Because they're just going to cancel each other out. But look, is 7 pi over 6 between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2? It is not, right? So the answer here is not 7 pi over 6. So how do we get it? Well, first what we can do is we can just say, hey, everyone, what's, what's sine of 7 pi over 6? So you go to your unit circle. Where is 7 pi over 6? Right there? 7 pi over 6? So you have like pi over 6, 2 pi over 6, 3 pi over 6, 4 pi over 6, 5 pi over 6, 6 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6 is right here. And sine means give me the y coordinate there. So what is the y coordinate at this point? 
negative one half. Right? Okay. So that means we have arc sine of negative one half. And now this is asking you sine of what angle? Right? This right here is asking you sine of what angle is negative one half. So do you, you go to a different unit circle and you say where is your y coordinate negative one half? And that happens here and here, right? Aren't those the two places that your y coordinate is negative one half? But because you're talking about inverse trig functions, you're not allowed to look over here, are you? You have to be here. So what is this angle? Negative pi over 6. So the answer to this is negative pi over 6. All right. So it can be a little tricky with that cancellation property. Questions on that? Just out of curiosity, what would happen if I change this 7 pi over 6 to pi over 6? Now is pi over 6 between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2? Yes. And so this would just spit out pi over 6. It would. So just pay attention. This is going to come up in your homework assignment. Just have to be a little careful with what's going in inside there, what the argument of the function is. All right. So that was all just recap. Now, what this is really about, because this is calculus, is what's the derivative of these? Now that we've defined the six trig, uh, inverse trig functions in pre-cal, can you take derivatives of these functions? And if so, what, what are the derivatives? All right? That seemed a pretty natural question to ask. All right. Well, in order to do this, in order to figure out what these derivatives are, and there would be six of them, wouldn't there? Six derivatives. In order to figure them out, you're going to need to know how to do two things. How to create reference triangles, and how to use implicit differentiation from Cal 1. So this will be a good exercise to kind of like stir up those ideas again. All right, this first one. If y equals arc sine of x, find the derivative. So I'm going to let y equal arc sine of x. I want us to find y prime. And just remember that y prime is dy dx. It's the derivative of y with respect to x. All right. So I, what I could do is I just come in here and I could take derivative on the left and right. So the derivative of the left would be y prime. And the derivative of the right would be, well, we don't know, right? That's, th that's the point. We don't know what the derivative of the right is. That's what we're trying to figure out. Do you all understand? We, don't know what we really don't know what to do here. So what we're going to do is we're going to use what we do know. And in Cal 1, we figured out that the derivative of sine was cosine, um, right? That was something we determined. So the only way I can incorporate that into here is if I somehow transform this to have sines instead of arc sines. So how about if we just use the one-to-one -one property and the cancellation property together and just do like taking the sine on both sides of the equation. What would we get on the right side? We should just get x, so long as x is within the domain restrictions, right? So let's just assume that it is. Um, then we should just get x here, and on the left side, sine y. OK. I closed out. I was in Canvas earlier. I'll just, I'll just say this, all right, because I, I know I haven't given you all time to go and read the syllabus. But I have a policy on two specific things that I don't tolerate in a class, and my, I think my former students can tell you what they are. Cell phones, no cell phones during class, and the other one? Perfume. Perfume. <laughs> that guy, he smelled good, didn't he? No, no. Sleeping. Okay? Those are the two things, all right? If you're going to fall asleep in class, 
or you're going to use your phone in class, it's going to cost you 10 points on your next exam. You'll be asked to leave. You'll be counted absent for the day. You only get four absences. All right? I don't want to have to make an example out of anyone, but I will. All right? I know it's fair warning. You've been on your cell phone. I'm not calling you out like you're not going to lose 10 points because you didn't know the rule. Now you do, right? Okay? You need to wake up because you're falling asleep. So if I see that, I'll make an example, but I think today I could just, what would be better is if I just ask, what's the derivative of the left side of this, sir? Yep, what's the derivative of sine y? Negative. Okay. You want an opportunity? I'm not calling you out, but you're looking at me like you want to answer, no? No? Okay. Anyone? Derivative of sine y? Cosine y. Cosine y. Times y prime. Okay, now, this is where I said there are two things we have to be able to do, implicit differentiation and um, reference triangles. When we're doing implicit differentiation here, what we're doing is we're going to take this equation, I'm going to box it right now, and we're going to take the derivative of this with respect to x on both sides. Pardon me? DY, uh, we're going to go d dx on both sides. This just means I'm taking the derivative, treating x as my independent variable of sine of y. That means y is a function of x, and that's critical because what's the derivative of y? It's not 1, unless you're differentiating with respect to y. It's dy dx if you're differentiating with respect to x. So if, this is where I said um, implicit. If you need to, go, you know, go back to your calculus one lecture notes and take a look at implicit differentiation. Make sure you know how to do this with chain rule. So the derivative of the left side is going to be, you said cosine y, I agree. But then chain rule says, now you have to take the derivative of what's inside this sine function, which is y, what's the derivative of y with respect to x, dy dx. Now, most, time, most of the time, I would write y prime, but that y prime could also be dy dx. It depends on how you were shown. How many of you, your instructor did dy dx? Okay, so you can put dy dx there, it's fine. And then I guess everyone else, it was y prime? All right, am I done taking the derivative on the left side? Left side. Oh, yes. yes? There's nothing else to do there? Okay, what's the derivative of x with respect to x? That's 1. Okay, so now I have equals 1. Right? Now, what I've done is, I, you know, if we kind of backtrack here, I started with something I didn't know, right? I said, okay, but I can take the, in, the sign on both sides, use the cancellation property, and then I'm stuck with this new equation then use implicit differentiation, and by doing that, I have generated the thing I'm trying to solve for, right? I'm trying to find y prime. Here it is. I just need to solve for it now. So divide by cosine, 1 over cosine y. And this is great. We've got an answer, but there's one problem with the answer. I want it in terms of x, right? Like, look, the original function, sorry, arc sine of x, is arc sine of x. So the derivative of it should have x in the answer. It's not wrong. This is not incorrect. But we like our answers to have the original variable in them, right? So can I somehow get this in terms of x? Yeah. That's, I'm going to use this right here. Okay? I'm going to use this information to somehow convert this. So what I have right now is some information about y. I would like something that connects y and x together and I have an equation right here that connects y and x together. And from this equation right here, I will generate a picture. This is a standard procedure. This is called drawing a reference triangle. I'm going to draw a right triangle, because we know a lot of information about right triangles. Since y is inside the sine function, y is an angle, isn't it? So I'm going to create, I'm just going to call this y right here. And sine, by definition, on a right triangle is always opposite over hypotenuse, isn't it? It's a ratio of the opposite side over the hypotenuse. So when I say that sine of y is equal to x, I'm saying that x is actually the, hypoten uh, the opposite over the hypotenuse, isn't it? So I'm going to rewrite x as x over 1, because x over 1 is x, isn't it? And so I could come here and label my triangle x here and 1 here, and then 
Would you agree that that right triangle represents that equation? Yeah? And what's good about that right triangle is that now I could ask you, what is cosine of y? And the only thing you would need to know is what the adjacent side is, which we don't know. But we have two sides of a right triangle. If you have two sides of a right triangle, you can always solve for the third, can't you? Pythagorean identity. So let's just call this side A for adjacent. Let's just do a quick little computation over here. I know A squared plus X squared must be 1 squared. And then let's solve this for A. So I will subtract X squared on both sides. And then take the square root. Now technically, when I take a square root, when I come in, when, when I, when you, if you ever take the square root on both sides of an equation, you must always do plus or minus. But because this is representing the leg of a triangle, I'm going to always think that that's going to be a positive length. So I'm going to throw out the negative, all right, and just look at the positive answer. So that's what A is, all right? So I'm going to just go here, replace that with 1 minus x squared. And now, can you tell me from this picture now what cosine of y is? So back to this, y prime is 1 over, cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So it's going to be this over this, isn't it? Which is just root 1 minus x squared. There it is. So the derivative of arc sine of x <coughs> has nothing to do with the trig function. You know how when we took the derivative of sine, we got cosine? We took derivative of cosine, we got sine? When you take derivatives of inverse trig functions, you're not getting inverse trig functions back out. You're getting these weird rational functions. Well, they're not even rational functions because that's a root. So you're just getting some strange functions, right? But that's our derivative. We good? All right. The other five inverse trig functions all have derivatives. And you can find them using the same method that I just did here. Like, if this was cosine right here, what do you think you would do next if this was cosine? Cosine, cosine on both sides, right? And then you would differentiate, implicit differentiation. You would solve for y prime. You would come over here, figure out what you had. You would use that information to draw a triangle. And you'd figure out the relationship between the sides and work it out. One of your homework problems is to find the derivative of the inverse cosecant function. So I'll let you do that, all right? I don't see myself asking you a problem like this on a test, but that could come, I could ask you something like that as a quiz problem, all right? And it's definitely on your homework, so. That's it for that, I'm gonna move ahead. Once we have a formula, right, once we actually have formula, we can just use it, just like we did in Cal 1. I'm going to put this formula up here just so we have it, so I can reference it. We should all know now that the derivative, I'm going to use that prime notation for derivative. The derivative of arc sine of x is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Right? So with that knowledge, Let's see if we can find the derivative of this. So now, take the derivative with respect to x of this function. We have an inverse sine function, right? Inside of the inverse sine function, which the inside of the function is called the argument. So the argument of this inverse sine function is a square root. And inside that square root is an x squared plus 1. So if we're asked to find the derivative, what rule are we going to need in this case? Chain rule. How many layers do we have to this composition of functions? How many layers do you see? Probably three. You have an inside layer, which is a polynomial, x squared plus 1. The next outer layer is a root. And then the last layer is the arc sine. 
So here's where you get to see if you understand chain rule. The derivative of this, right, the derivative of that should be equal to 